everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, women's health needs and concerns have been overlooked, I'm sure you'll agree, for far too long. So it's really exciting to have people here with me today who are not only passionate about changing that, but who have already brought products to market that are actively doing this every day. So I'd like to kick off with a little statistic. Um, uh, women are born with two million eggs ready to go. By the time they turn 35, they only have 400 of these eggs left. Um, so while we're on the topic of age, um, I think uh, perhaps we should dive in by talking a little bit about how each of your companies are meeting the needs of these women who are wanting to have children older, but who perhaps don't have the uh, eggs left to do so. Um, Martin, why don't you kick us off? Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, I guess what qualifies me to be on this panel is to have had a baby nine months ago born out of frozen eggs and to run Prelude uh, together with Susan Hertzberg. And Prelude, we raised $200 million to help people have babies at any age, babies when they're ready. So if we had babies between 15 and 25, we would be mostly fine, although humans are the most, are the worst animals at reproducing ourselves. Even at 20, around 8% of people cannot have uh, children. In that, at that time, mostly because of men. And so what we offer at Prelude is a package that's only in the United States so far, maybe in Europe later, where women pay $200 a month and they start their journey, men to women freeze their eggs, men freeze their sperm, and they start their journey so they can have children at any age, uh, most likely, let's say, of course, you're never sure, but you can greatly increase the odds of have children at any age. And as someone who has seven children myself, and the last one nine months old, I can tell you that it's a great thing to have children whenever you're ready. <laughs> well, congratulations. Um, Angie, why don't you tell us a little bit about what your company does? Thank you very much. So, um, Salmatics actually is a women's health company that builds products specifically leveraging big data and genomics to help women make more informed decisions about career, life, and just kind of around family planning. This year, we launched the world's first genetic test, a test called Fertilome, which is designed specifically to help women understand genetic risk factors that may be influencing their ability to conceive today or tomorrow. So the test actually looks at common reproductive conditions like endometriosis, PCOS, or a condition called POI, which affects about 1% of people, um, which actually leads to menopause before the age of 40, okay? So this information is incredibly valuable for women in understanding what their own biology says about their ability to have children today or in the future. And so, whereas we're a complement to what Martina's doing, which is we just want to help women have that information up front to make the decision that is best for them. And that could lead to having kids sooner, it could be egg freezing, it could be undergoing IVF, all of those are as options, but what we believe is that genetics is the key to really understanding that one additional risk factor in understanding your own personal fertility. That's great. Um, and Alina, your company obviously does something slightly different. You, uh, you've got the only uh, medically approved uh, app for, that can be used as contraception. And I believe you've had some, uh, some good news today um, to do with your company. But, uh, so why don't you tell us a bit about that and also about what you plan to do uh, in terms of further personalizing uh, women's options. So indeed, the Natural Cycles is foremost a digital contraception, as we are the only one that is certified as a medical device for contraception. Uh, however, our users usually use our app throughout all stages in their lives, so both for preventing pregnancy, planning a pregnancy, and also monitoring their pregnancy. And we do that through uh, tracking women's body temperature to detect ovulation and mapping out their cycle. So it works both ways. And we've also recently developed a infertility algorithm because we do see in the women's data if they show early signs of infertility and also if it maybe shows signs that they will take longer to conceive although their probability of conceiving is not lower so we then have a timing when we tell the woman now is the time to actually seek help and then we connect them with the fertility clinic and um, they get the first checkup for free and they usually appreciate that because we give them their insight they need to understand their fertility. 
And indeed, today we, we announced that we just closed our Series B of $30 million. So it's very exciting. Yeah. And yeah. Very good. Thank you. Congratulations. And a lot of that money would go into um, hiring more researchers to develop more uh, smart algorithms to diagnose women in their reproductive health. That's great. Um, so um, obviously, there's a, there's a kind of a trend here towards uh, personalized uh, healthcare, which is increasingly becoming important in the medical world. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, um, Angie, if you could tell us a little bit about what you and uh, Somatics have discovered about um, women's, uh, the, 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 the huge differences in women's uh, potential uh, for fertility and um, how you know, you're going about uh, helping them understand that. Absolutely. So we actually just completed a, a, a fairly large study of over 4,000 women in understanding how millennial women, this next wave of women who are aging into motherhood, are thinking about fertility and reproductive health. And I think what was not surprising is that two-thirds of the women surveyed really want to start their families in their 30s. Okay? And 90% of these women want to have more than one child, which means that the vast majority of women, many of you in this room, are planning to have kids into your mid to late 30s. Now, unfortunately, so much of us get our news from, from you know, Google, Dr. Google, which we jokingly say, from women's magazines, and we're all kind of taught that as long as you have kids before the age of 35, you're totally golden. You're set, you're fine. Um, but the reality is, is that oftentimes an individual's biology can be quite different. And in fact, just as many women can have children into their 40s as women will have difficulty in their 20s. And so really understanding how your biology works can really help you then fine tune, okay, what does family planning mean for me? What does timing mean for me? Because what we so often hear from women, um, and, and, and referencing kind of what you were talking about with infertility, is that women will often look back and say, I wish I'd only known, right? I wish I'd only known. Couples who get married and they say, let's travel the world, we're gonna wait five years, and then we'll start our family. But what if you knew up front what your risk factors might be? I mean, that's the ultimate form of personalized medicine for reproductive health, right? In the same way that cancer has been revolutionized with the use of genetic markers, we should be doing the same for women's health. Yeah, that's great. Um, now, Martin, you, uh, you and your wife have been through the egg freezing process, so you have a kind of first-hand experience of this. Um, now, obviously, uh, it's become a very visible topic in recent years, but there are uh, cons to the process as well as pros you know the uh, women have to go through a certain amount of things in order to freeze their eggs um, now I was just wondering if you could talk through perhaps from your personal perspective a little bit about what the pros and the cons are um, and whether you think the, that that is visible enough well we <coughs> we have 4,400 babies already born out of frozen eggs so the technology works pretty well. It works especially well if you freeze eggs under the age of 35 and if by when you have an AMH, which is some indication over two. But the sad news is that last year in the United States and in Europe is even worse. Uh, women who turn 45, only 19% uh, of them didn't have any babies and 22% only had one baby. And before they were 30, they said they wanted between two and three, right? So there's an incredible failure. People are not having the amount of babies they would like to have. We don't fly airlines that crash a third of the time. We don't drive cars that stall a third of the time. But we fail a third of the time at having the number of children we'd like to have. The process for preserving fertility for the man it's simple, it's like you masturbate and you leave some sperm and that's it, right? So men have it easy. We are also, we should freeze our sperm because there's a large Scandinavian study that shows that women in their 20s who have babies with men in their 40s and 50s or women in their 20s who have babies with men in their 20s, the women in their 20s who have babies with men in their 40s and 50s, their babies or their children have twice the rate of severe mental illness. So men are contributors of mental illness more than contributors of infertility. And that's something that we would like to avoid as a society. And I'm talking about like severe autism, unable to speak, like severe mental illness, not being original, which we should all welcome, okay? I'm not a 
I'm not going to stigmatize people with mental illness, but I'm talking about severe mental illness. So the process for a man, as I said, it's kind of like what you do frequently, except that this time you do it for a purpose, which is to keep your sperm. For a woman, and my wife is in the audience, and she did it twice, and she would be better than me to qualify it and come here and explain it. I was just a witness to her two stimulation cycles. I would, it's around two weeks of uh, getting hormones, and it's about a 90-minute egg retrieval well, the retrieval is actually 10 minutes, but you stay 90 minutes in bed. Uh, so when I asked my wife, how was, how was egg freezing? She said, it's not a walk in the park, but it's easier than a bikini wax or other things that women actually go through, <laughs> especially certainly easier than giving birth, okay? So if you go through this and you, you take eight hours of your life, so you have a lifetime of optionality. And again, I'm not a woman and I'm not qualified to say exactly what the pain is like, but I think anybody who would like to ask Nina, it's certainly worth it. That's great. <laughs> um, so uh, Alina, um, you uh, have always advocated for uh, really great uh, education and um, women taking uh, the responsibility for educating themselves uh, you know, on themselves through uh, the through the app, which relies on um, the a natural form of childbirth, um, but does require a lot of input from the women. Um, now, in terms of fertility, um, do you think we're doing enough to educate women on their options, and how do we um, start to make sure that women know what those options are early on in life? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's almost frightening to see how low education is around how the woman's body works, mm -hmm. uh, especially in some countries the, in particular. And, and it's, it's not strange because often women are put to an artificial state of infertility from teenage years by, by the pill, and they only stop using it when it's time to have children. And then they don't realize that actually it's not always that easy, and they have no idea how their body works. Uh, maybe they have certain conditions like PCOS, etc., where often the doctor prescribed the pill to mask the symptoms mm -hmm. of it, but if you only ovulate a few times per year, it can be very difficult to conceive naturally. And that's very important to have this information up front as well. So what we see among our users is indeed that the fact that they get to know their bodies is the most appreciated side effect of using our app for contraception. And I think education is really key here. And it's, it's scary how little we learn in school, et cetera, about how the body actually works. Mm. Martin. No, I, <coughs> I was going to say that why would a company that does so much technology endorse a company like Natural Cycles? But we do endorse it because as well as we endorse Selmatics, why? Because both companies, Natural Cycles and Selmatics, help women and men potentially, women and men, but mostly women, become aware of what's going on. Because being irregular is the first sign of something going on wrongly with your reproductive cycle. So we believe that their efforts, I mean, certainly Selmatics, is, it gives the doctors more information about what could be possibly be wrong. And Natural Cycles is kind of like the first point of entry where you're saying, okay, now I don't want to have a baby, and I'm doing this as a contraceptive. But the pill is also a contraceptive, obviously, and much more commonly used, but the pill masks infertility. Like when people are on the pill, they think I'm regular, everything is fine, everything's fine. Then they go off the pill, and it's like, in many cases, not fine. So we believe that Natural Cycles works better in that sense because you're aware of what's going on. And yeah. we do see also in our, in our clinical studies that if you use natural cycles before for contraception versus if you come off hormonal contraception when you start planning a child using our app, so with the technology, it's the factor three in difference in time it takes to, to get pregnant. So it's a, it's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And um, Angie, when we spoke last week, you said that it's really important for somatics to meet women where they are. 
Um, and I was wondering, um, could you tell us a, b a bit about some of the outreach that you're doing um, in order to try and help women understand and make the best choices for them? Right, I think I echo what everyone else has said, which is that there is a huge opportunity for us to be educating more women on how they can take greater control of their bodies. And you know, so often what we hear in talking to women, over the course of my career at Cellmatics, I've we've heard from about 7,000 individual women, and oftentimes what they are, um, companies or, or even physicians will talk to them assuming where they should be. And really, where we should be starting is, with no judgment, going to women and saying, let's start where you are and help you get comfortable with the information that you need. I mean, that's particularly important when we're launching something that's brand new to the market. So not only are we trying to make sure that women understand how their body works and how reproduction works, but also how do genes relate to fertility. I mean, that's something that's completely novel to the vast majority of people in this country, or in this world. And so really what we have taken is kind of a taking a step back, a no judgment approach of saying, let's start with basic biology. You know, here's what a uterus is. Here's where the fallopian tubes are. Here's what the ovaries do. And that level of education opens up so much dialogue because then people you know, start to slowly raise their hand and ask questions like, oh, will be my birth control, will that affect my long-term fertility? No, it doesn't. And people are like, oh, really? And so they start to ask a lot more questions. And so the more that we can make it less intimidating and more and, and embrace the opportunity for women to find strength and power in knowledge and information, the further and, and the faster we'll get to where we need to be. Um, and obviously, while education is one issue, the other issue that many women will face if they're considering this is, is the cost. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if any of you have any ideas about how we can make sure that this is not only easy to understand for all women, but it's accessible eventually to all women. Yeah, I think cost is a huge problem. Uh, so in the United States, some of the solution is the large corporates that have offered to start in paying for this, Apple, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Goldman Sachs, and so on. But to be fair, it's a only a small group of privileged women who work in those companies, right? Those companies are the companies that pay the highest salaries in the world, the most successful companies in the world. But what about all the rest of the women who want to have babies in a country, the United States, where the fertility rate is so low that it's not even replenishing the population and immigration is essential to um, keep the population stable. And in countries like Portugal, Italy, Spain, the fertility rate is the, among the lowest in the world. Germany, 1.6, 1.2. Uh, in Italy, 1.3 in Spain. And so everybody is worried about the world, the environment, and overpopulation, and frankly, Europe and the US and Japan and China and Korea, the population is shrinking. And what about helping all the other women who don't work for Apple or Facebook or whatever? So we are doing our small share in the sense that we, instead of having to pay 10,000 in the US, which is what you have to pay up front with the cost of the egg freezing plus the cost of the medication, we launch a subscription model for $199 a month so women pay $199 a month, which in the United States is the cost of maybe a dinner out or something like that for a couple. Uh, so we made it more affordable. In Europe, when we come to Europe, we feel we could probably come with a price that is at least a third lower. Maybe it's going to be <coughs> 99 pounds a month or 120 euros a month. I don't know. We have to think about it. But it's this concept of making it affordable. The other thing to think about also is that um, there is a, a way to think about this information as helping even prevent infertility, right? So the idea is that if you can know this information up front, and, and it's just about education, right? Knowing this education information up front, it may influence the timing of your decision making around having a child. And what we, we, too, we too often hear is that women learn this information too late, mm -hmm. and so there is a greater shift in, with the education around how do you understand your body, how do you understand your clinical metrics, how do you understand your lifestyle, your environment, all those pieces together. There's as much um, education and empowerment that can come from learning that up front that doesn't require money, right? Yeah. It's really just about educating yourself and being open to learning more about yourself. Yeah. And of course, egg freezing might not be right for everyone. Um, and you know, just having that information, you're right, can maybe help people avoid having to go through egg freezing if that's not something that they want to do. Yeah, we actually had, I mean, we have had um, women take our test who actually said, great, I'm not going to do anything differently because mm -hmm. 
they didn't have any markers that really caused concern. And so just having that knowledge and peace of mind meant they felt comfortable waiting the five years that they could, you know, before making a decision. Um, similarly, we've also had other, uh, other uh, women who have taken our test, realized that they were at heightened risk for early menopause, and then decided proactively to then freeze their eggs. And so I think what it is is, you know, I think what we would all agree is there's no one solution for every single person. I mean, the age of big data and genomics, none of us should be making the exact same medical decisions. So the more information that you have, you can then make the right decisions. And so in that case, in particular, um, she took the Fertilum test, learned that she had markers for uh, early menopause, decided to freeze her eggs, and her parents helped her pay for it, you know? So there's a lot of creative ways that people are, are making do with the priorities that are right for them. Mm, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I really do think that, you know, there's always value for money. And I think if you have no awareness that you have any prospective infertility problem in your 20s, you're probably unlikely to pay for this. But if you do know that you, you have a short follicular phase that is irregular, so probably mm -hmm. you're running out of eggs already, then you will prioritize your, your money towards being able to have future children rather than maybe spending it on a nice trip or something yeah. else. <laughs> Um, and we are nearly out of time, but I would like to come back to the point that Martin made about um, egg freezing as a work perk, and uh, whether you think it's a good idea or whether if it is presented to women as a work perk, they'll feel like they have to take it up. Is, is there a risk of that, do you think? I mean, having it as a perk, that would be a great problem to have, right? If you have <laughs> the option of being able to say, here, your company's gonna pay for this, then great. Um, it's, it's a wonderful thing, and we're seeing more and more of this because as the uh, competition for, for really, ta really strong talent increases, um, there's like a war up in HR of trying to create more and more benefits. And it used to be that you offered a cereal bar and therefore it was a really fancy thing and now they keep upping it up. Um, for us, we really are excited about the growing awareness that this is something that is a fundamental, you know, it shouldn't be something that's only limited to the wealthy. It's something that should be universal and allowed by everyone to have the, the family or the lifestyle they ultimately want. Uh, regarding the companies, there's been a lot of debate because some people say, oh, Apple, Facebook, they don't want women to have children. They're f paying for egg freezing because they don't want women to have children. That's just false. Mm. These companies have childcare, they have places they help you with your child. They, they, it is absolutely false that they're not trying to, they're trying to prevent women to have children. Interestingly, in America, that was not the criticism, and in Europe, that was the criticism, and that is hurting the employees of these large corporates in Europe because the European corporates are afraid of offering the same benefits because of the backlash of being perceived as anti-family people. A company is anti-family if they only help you freeze your eggs and they do nothing for your children. <laughs> then that would be anti-family, but that is not the case. Yeah. These are very pro-family companies. They just want to help women have children when they are ready. Mm -hmm. I was speaking to somebody yesterday who was saying that, in fact, um, having, having an employee that has a child when they are at your company is almost a great compliment to you as an employer because it shows that they feel stable and happy and that they are likely to, you know, that they consider themselves sort of settled um, and therefore, you know, you could take it as a compliment as well. Well, we're Wonderful. out of time, but thank you so much. Thank um, you very much. I hope thank you, you for having us. It. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.